Good evening and welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Lee Vandervu in support of As the World Burns. She'll be joined in conversation this evening by Professor Rebecca D. Harden from the University of Michigan. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity as well to th on behalf of Literati to thank the School for Environment and Sustainability for partnering with us to present um, tonight's event. They've been such lovely event partners with us in the past, and um, it's great to be able to have that opportunity again, even during this very strange time for the university and for the bookstore. Um, a reminder about our Zoom etiquette, uh, as you heard me as you're getting connected, um, you're muted and you will remain muted. Speaker views the ideal viewing experience, that way you'll just see whoever is speaking on your screen. And we do ask that you keep your video off through the duration of the event. The chat is closed for public chatting, but you might want to keep the chat window open. I'll be present there to drop uh, links to purchase As the World Burns from Literati Bookstore. And you can use the chat to send me questions for the Q&A at any time. You can send your questions directly to me as soon as they come to you. And I will read a selection of them um, at the conclusion of the conversation. So whenever you feel compelled to, to write a question or ask a question, feel free to send it to me right in the chat. And as a reminder, you can purchase As the World Burns on our website. Like I said, I'll include a link in the chat. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are links to purchase in the description below. You can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com. Thousands of titles are available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programs, uh, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this afternoon or this morning, depending on wherever and whenever in the world you are joining us from. So without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce our author and moderator this evening. Lee Vandervu is an award-winning investigative and environmental journalist. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Atlantic, Slate, Guardian, and others. Lee's reporting has received the Logan Fellowship, the Alicia Patterson Foundation Fellowship, an Investigative Reporters and Editors Award, and the Lizzie Grossman Grant for Environmental Health Reporting. Her first book, The Fish Market, won an Oregon Book Award for general nonfiction. And Rebecca D. Harden is Associate Professor in Behavior, Education, and Communication Environmental Justice at the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. Please join me in using your Zoom clap uh, reactions to welcome Lee and Rebecca into your living rooms. Thank you. Thank you everybody so much for the warm welcome. And um, I wanna just also thank Literati for the opportunity to be in this community. It's, uh, it feels different than a classroom and it feels great. And I know that a lot of are doing classrooms online right now so it's hard to get off a whole day online and hop online for the evening which is just a tribute to Lee and the work that has happened with this book that we have such a great crowd it's no surprise to me I'll just open by saying that the music you all were hearing in the background as we were all climbing on the call is a really really wonderful song uh, by the artist Chutescott who appears also in the book as a kind of protagonist and a political activist who's working on these climate issues. That music is available on iTunes and it's um, and Spotify too, as far as I know. Uh, it's a tune called Boom Box Warfare. And you've got a link um, perhaps in the chat or maybe I just dropped it into the Literati address, but I'll drop it into the chat for everyone to see in case you'd like a little bit of a soundtrack for tonight's work together and for the work that Lee is describing in this beautiful, compelling book. Lee, I'm inclined to actually dive in by asking you to, to begin by reading just a little bit of your prose for those who may still be finishing the book or maybe coming to us with the book in their hands but not yet in their minds. It'll let us center on your particular voice in describing these challenges. Thank you so much for the link. Um, and it will, um, which is now in the chat. If you all want to go hear the rest of that beautiful song, you can do it. But Lee, let's hear your beautiful prose, if you don't mind. Would you would you be okay with starting in with a little bit of a of a of a passage for us? I was thinking of the one about the Navajo Nation that speaks directly to the racial equity questions, which are on all of our minds right now in relation to these environmental challenges. And I think it starts around page two o five in the print version of the book. I'm not sure. 
Um, but it starts with the words growing up here. And I think it might just kick us off with a, a sense of, of the book's power and strength. Um, and also maybe a prose, a prose corollary to that phenomenal poem set to music that is Jutte Scott's Boombox Warfare Song. Sure, thanks, thanks Rebecca and thanks John for the great intros, you guys, I'm happy to read. Um, this is uh, Jamie Butler, she's a plaintiff in Juliana versus the United States and, and my book is about the 21 young people who sued the federal government in a constitutional lawsuit over climate change um, in, in this case. And so uh, it, it talks a lot about their background stories and how they came to the case and who they are and against that narrative is this backdrop of this crazy political year that we had in America in 2018 and also the year that we learned that um, you know, we have 12 years or bust to address climate change. So this is a bit of Jamie's story. Growing up here, Jamie learned about climate change when she was nine. She joined Juliana of the United States at 14 she did it for the animals because she was worried about what climate change would do to them. But Jamie worries more today about what climate change will do to her and to other Navajo people like her. Sometimes these concerns about harms to the animals and harms to the Diné are more or less the same concerns. The summer of 2013 underscores what she means. That year the drought lasted into what used to be the rainy season. In the wild horses that roamed free, many were dying of thirst. There were reports of horses with ribs sticking out, horses found dead at dried up watering holes, and horses who tried to kick their way into watering tanks for a drink. The horses were a new kind of problem, generally. The land was already overtaxed by drought and the horse population was meanwhile growing larger all the time. The Navajo had lived peacefully with feral horses for decades, but with the drought, they had to confront the reality of the land not being able to support the horses along with all the rest. The Diné were having cultural clashes over what should be done, whether the horses ought to be rounded up and adopted off the reservation or sold. Such talk collided with traditional values, like the value to just let the horses be. But no matter their feelings, people cared about the horses and did not want to see them suffer. That summer, the drought in the central part of the reservation was especially unyielding. In one report, the Navajo Times relayed the tale of a herd fighting for a wet patch of mud where a faucet had dripped, their bodies queued up so thick it was impossible to tell until after they were loaded into trailers, too tired and malnourished to fight what the commotion was even about. Only after they were cleared away did the tiny spot of wet ground show. A few years later, the spring of 2018 brought drought so severe that Jamie remembers it more starkly than most. The winter was drier than ever before, the spring runoff sparse, and there was no snowpack to feed the watering holes where the horses and livestock went to drink when the rivers ran dry. In one part near Cameron, there's like this little flat part that absorbs a ton of water, Jamie says. She's talking about a stock pond where animals have long come for water in the worst of times, the water brackish and left to the wild. That year, it was a sliver of itself and what water was there was being swallowed slowly by the dusty soil underneath. The sparse water on dry soil, the two mixed like porridge, not like something you could drink. It just became quicksand. Right in the middle of it, there was just a small pond, a little puddle basically. And because there was no water in the area, all the wild horses around there came and tried to get the water. More than 110 horses died in the mud, maybe more than could be safely counted after others slipped deep underground. Their bodies were found in a ring around the puddle, their coats caked in hardened earth from struggling for anything to drink. The ground around this muddy circle was dusty, held the bones of dead horses past, and later it was encircled in barbed wire so officials could move on to what came next, excavating bodies to deter scavenging birds and dogs, avoid disease and clear out the smell. It's just kind of rough seeing things go down that we have no control over. It affects everyone, Jamie says. For the rest of the summer, people hauled water for themselves and for the horses too. Rescue organizations sent hay in plastic tubs to make safe troughs. In another year of ceaseless drought, filling the tubs would become a new kind of normal. 
These conditions horrify Jamie, and she worries most for older members of her community, like her grandmother. It's just really strenuous on the elders, who are the main people who still have our culture, Jamie says. She explains how many still live alone in the traditional earthen homes, tending their flocks of sheep and horses in the vast, empty parts of the desert. They haul their own water, gather their own plants, some farm their own food. They face a tougher job as water gets scarcer. Advancing age already makes life difficult for Jamie's grandma Eleanor, older than 80 and living alone with sheep and a couple of horses. Jamie says her grandmother sometimes spends hours driving for water. She used to just drive into Cameron, but since there isn't enough water in Cameron for everyone, the wells run dry, she has to go to Tuba City, another half an hour away, or another hour to Flagstaff, sometimes even farther to Loop. Because the elders are the keepers of the old ways, the water gone out of the land can spell the tradition gone out of it too. If elders are no longer able to live a traditional life, there is less of a way for the younger generations to learn. Jamie learned in sheep camp with her grandma, and this is normal in the Navajo Nation to kind of grow up with your relatives and tend the horses and sheep in the summertime. And, and so when she talks about this, if her grandma's not out there on that land, that is, um, you know, culturally, every young uh, Navajo person would, would struggle with having access to their cultural rituals if the elders leave the, the desert. I want to thank you for, for reading that. It's a very stark, um, it's a very stark description and it's hard. It was hard to read. It's hard to hear. Um, but it, it does start us out with a sense of the urgency out of which I guess you were, you were into which you were writing um, in this book. And some of the urgency that undergirds the creation of Guardians of the Earth and the ways that these young plaintiffs are taking the legal tools they have to try desperately to get the attention of a broader world and of more elders. Um, it's a really remarkable narrative too of how differently lived the experiences of climate change are. And maybe in a moment we can move from drought to flood because the way you describe Jaden's experience with flooding is also incredibly powerful. And I, I think you've done an incredible job of weaving together these, these very different lived experiences into um, a, you know, a, a collaborative fabric. I don't know if you could say a few words about the, the group of, of kids that you're describing here and some of what you've taken away from working with them and, and, and conveying their stories in this book. I mean, what, what your, your sense is of the challenges they're taking up, the chances they have of, of you know, where it's all at right now. Maybe talk to us a little bit about um, wh where we are now and, and what you've taken from these young people. Sure, well, the book starts in uh, October of 2018 and that was, uh, October 29th was the day that the plaintiffs were supposed to get a trial. It had been a long time coming. It had been delayed once before. Um, and uh, right before the trial, I mean, literally, you know, the expert witnesses were there, the plaintiffs were there, uh, metaphorically on the courthouse steps, the trial was canceled. And there's a lot of detail in the book about why, I mean, essentially this trial and, and other cases like it that have been really close to the president's agenda, um, like DACA, the Muslim travel ban, um, there have been some pretty extraordinary legal maneuvers that I won't, I won't describe now, but, but this prevented the plaintiffs from getting their day in court. And um, it's hard to talk about them as a group because they're all really different people. But that was the one occasion that I had to see most of them together. And they do come together. They have this incredible energy. You know, they're, um, they've been in this for five years. Um, their case was filed in 2015. The youngest at the time was eight years old. The oldest was 19. Um, they're from very diverse landscapes. Uh, 10 are from Oregon, but some from the South, a very rural conservative farm area, uh, and some from the central cities where they're litigating things like impact to their allergies and asthma and impact to the oceans. Um, but the rest of the plant come from, come from some pretty 
uh, interesting landscapes. One of the plants is from Alaska, so he's litigating um, the melting permafrost and the loss of his Arctic lifestyle. There's a plaintiff who um, was adopted from the Marshall Islands, so she re represents island nations that are going underwater. Similarly, the youngest plaintiff lives on a barrier island off the coast of Florida and is facing the loss of, of his home as it sinks below sea level. And he's been evacuated numerous times out of the path of hurricanes as well, which are increasing in intensity with climate change. So they, they are people who are living the effects of climate breakdown right now. Um, you know, the, the horrible fires that we had here this summer are a good example. Two of the Oregon plants were there, uh, filed, filed their grievance um, because of their fear of losing their family farms to, to forest fire. And they're, they've just had very near misses this summer. So this is real stuff. Um, they're very different. Uh, they're very, um, you know, I, I would say half are, are people of color, six, seven indigenous roots. So they're culturally very different as well. But yet you put them together and um, there's an incredible energy around them. They're very focused. They're very uh, committed to the mission of, of advocating for climate remediation. And, and they've had to carry a lot as young people. Lee, how did you find them? How did you come to this? Um, what do you think the deeper path of yours? I know that um, fish market, you know, you've done this amazing work on um, environmental issues in your own past, but I'd love to hear more of the kind of attenuated backstory to this. I mean, is there you as a tween or a teenager in here somewhere, anywhere? And what were you like at that age? Oh gosh, <laughs> you can ask my mom. I think she's on the, I think she's on the uh, event. Um, probably a handful, but what? <laughs> uh, you know, the backstory for me is I'm a I'm a journalist here in Oregon. There was a lot of media attention around this case as it was gearing up and as it was going to trial, and there was a lot of skepticism too, like no way 21 kids suing the federal government are going to get a trial. A lot of people thought that it was a publicity stunt. And when I was early days getting the press releases, that's what I thought too. So as we started to get toward, this is really going to happen and the clock was ticking and it was six months, five months, four months, and this trial was going to happen. I just kind of couldn't help myself. I was like, okay, I got to meet these kids and I got to figure out, are they being stage managed by like hand wringing parents? Are they props for the legal nonprofit that's running this, this litigation or are they for real? I really wanted to know. And I got a grant that enabled me to travel to the regions of the country that they come from, talk to them where they live, explore the climate impacts of their lives and kind of get to know them a little bit. And that's sort of what brought me into the story. And I do look for stories like this. Um, I like uh, I like stories about landscape because I like to work outside and I, the environment is important to me. But I think one of the main reasons I love environmental stories is not only because they come with these really passionate, committed, interesting characters, uh, which is one reason, but also because at the end of the day, to me, like environmental stories are, are really about one thing. It's, it's who benefits and who pays. And, and that is, I think, the most interesting question we can ask as journalists and, and certainly um, in the society that we live in it, is that who benefits and who pays. And this story to me is uh, extraordinary in that way because it, it really kind of pulled me into a deep understanding of how much young people are paying now and will pay later for the mistakes that we are making with the environment today. That is so, that is so true. And I, boy, I have so many things I want, I want to hear more about and, and hear you read. But I want to just say, before we go any further, to those of others on the call that um, we're quite serious, actually, um, about, it, you know, your, your feeling free to type questions into the chat um, that we can work into the conversation and read out as we go. We aren't wedded, me and Lee, to, uh, to any particular flow here, any particular sequence. And so if there's a part of the book you'd love to hear read aloud or hear how it was written, if there's a piece of the story you find especially puzzling or intriguing, please do type it in the chat and, and let us know what you'd like us to, to talk with you about tonight. 
it's our hour, right? With this story, these stories, and um, we are very much here to be in dialogue with all of you. In the meantime, I do think that that passage with Jaden about the flood is an incredible example of what you just mentioned, Lee, which is the power of these individual stories of these, these what it is that brought each of them to this work together. Um, and I think you've done a beautiful job of describing both the kind of contingency and the fragility of the coalition they constitute um, and the veracity of it, like the authenticity of it, like how real it is um, and how powerful it, it actually can be in the face of enormous, enormous, um, well, indifference, but worse, denial and um, opposition to what they're trying to ask all of us to pay attention to. So I wonder if, if you might be willing to, um, to read that passage. I think it's around page 69 in the print version. Am I right about that? Where there's this, and we are going from a, a description of drought to one of flood, but, but this phenomenon we're talking about of climate extremes and this volatile world does mean both for different people in different places. I think it's worth uh, tarrying there. Yeah, sure. Th thanks. Um, you know, I mean, Jaden, I think, is a is a plaintiff whose whose personal story really um, it speaks volumes. Not just about uh, denial uh, in the abdication of responsibility for older people to act on behalf of the young, but um, maybe also just uh, just the bruising sometimes that people take in this political climate. This is the toughest 15 year old I have ever met. Um, she lives in South Louisiana. She uh, has, has lived in a very hostile environment for being a plaintiff in this case. And, you know, she's, uh, she's tough as nails. So this is a bit of her story. In the morning, I'd first encountered Jaden in her bedroom, purple, after I found my way down a dark hall of her pink house. Jane's older sister, Erin, a few minutes awake, was flopped on the bed under a pastel comforter and Jaden was at her desk, the wall above it covered in watercolors and drawings. Jaden was friendly and talked about her activism and her art and her love for aeronautics, told me how captivated she is by planets and how she hopes to one day study science. She said the planets that used to adorn her room were still put away. The reference was to flooding that figured large in her pleadings. So I asked Jaden to tell me about the floods, especially the flood in 2016 and her expression darkened. Here's what she said. I woke up at like three, somewhere in the AM because my older sisters, Erin and Grace were knocking on my door and telling me to wake up, wake up. And that water was coming through the house. Of course, I thought I was dreaming because I was like, why the hell would water be coming through? I was kind of thinking, what do they want? I thought they were just trying to make me come out of my bed with some excuse or something. They weren't. Jaden sat up. She swung her legs to the floor and stepped into water up to her ankles. The house was a ranch on a slab, an L-shaped building with the longest length reaching deep into the backyard. Jaden was at the end of the stretch, in a room with a door to the yard, and outside it was raining hard. She walked toward her sister's voices in the hallway, opened the door to find them there. And as she did this, pulled the door toward her, the water rushed from her room into the rest of her home. I was like, oh my God, that's my fault. Oh my God, why did I open the door, she said. Elsewhere, water had been rising through the cracks in the foundation, soaking the carpeting. Sewage and old water rose in the toilets and in the bathtubs. But until then, most of it was in Jaden's bedroom with Jaden slowly leaking in from under the door. The sewage, had the worst smell in the world, it was so nasty, she said. My family ended up getting sick. A lot of my neighbors ended up getting sick. Jaden's brother, Dylan, her sister Grace and Grace's boyfriend went to the police station, but no one could help them much, just gave them a few sandbags to block the doors while the water rose. It wasn't enough. So next they used all the blankets, then the towels. So much water, they were no match for it. They gave up and focused on the electronics, on unplugging everything, worried about electrocution and trying to save what could be saved. Drawings and photos were lost anyway. Jaden's bed frame dissolved in the lake of her room. Her brother's toys were next. When I asked how high the water rose, she pointed to a watermark on the wall about two feet above the door. 
I hate that flood so much, she said. This is a storm that I think a lot of people don't realize was even a thing, but um, it, it's considered to be the nation's worst natural disaster since Sandy. It, it dumped uh, more than seven trillion gallon, gallons of water on Louisiana. It was essentially just a huge torrential downpour. And um, just to give you perspective on how much that really is, it's three times the amount of water that fell during Katrina. So these kinds of, of storms are increasingly common in South Louisiana and, and hence the flooding. Jaden's family ended up leaving that home. So it is also connected to housing insecurity and mobility in these ways that we are taught, I think all too often taught to fear in terms of some some massive crowd of humanity that's going to end up, you know, pressing in on our America, needing us to take them in, right? That's, I mean, that narrative of climate fear is, uh, I think, very pernicious and very, very wrong. Because when you look at these stories, people are incredibly resilient and aware. I think for Michiganders, you know, that passage is especially powerful after the spring we had with the devastation of Midland, Michigan and the failing of, a, of an old dam in Midland, Michigan that was connected to the Dow chemical site. And, you know, I just, I just don't think folks, certainly folks in the Midland area had, hadn't known devastation at that level until now. And I remember calling my, an in-law, my, my brother-in-law's mom, who lives up there and at 11 p.m. because the 11 o'clock nightly news was saying, if you know anyone in Midland and you are in a dry place anywhere else in the state, call them now and get them out of there. It was like the whole town was underwater all of a sudden. And so I, I think that that, yeah, it's very hard to contemplate a flood scenario like that without, uh, like, like the drought one before, without feeling like this is a thing of biblical proportions that we just aren't as a child of the 1980s, you know, I just feel like I grew up in this incredibly benign universe in which there was very little fire and flood, brimstone and hail. I mean, you know, there were lots of summer evenings with fireflies and fairly gentle rains. And I, I feel um, enormous sadness for my, my daughter and, and, and many of the young people now who are dealing with a world in which there's much more of an edge to so many natural processes, and then also this edge to the political and social processes behind, you know, and around it. And that, I think, you know, you also really do evoke in the book in, in various places. I guess maybe in particular Jacob's, Jacob's comments in chapter two, where, and this is also something that's on Michiganders' minds right now, right? This notion that um, in part, strangely enough, <laughs> when we are confronted by these enormous, almost inconceivable natural challenges, we fall to fighting. We fall to tearing ourselves apart instead of coming together in the ways that you described with difficulty, but ultimately with decisive power, these young people doing, right? I mean, it's not easy what they're doing across their varied experiences. But um, it, is a, it is a kind of model. And I, I wonder, yeah, I wonder if we could also look at that, that chapter two passage where Jacob is talking about the ways in which the, the opposition and hostility that you encounter can be very, very real. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I think Southern Oregon has some things in common with Michigan in that, um, you know, we have very active militias um, and, and extreme right movements. And I'm sure everybody in Michigan is thinking about that right now, given uh, developments of recent days. But, um, you know, this is one of the things that, uh, that I think is the toughest part about maybe for some of these folks being Juliana plaintiffs is like, you know, they're young and they're being, they're being put in this in this situation, um, so a little bit from Jacob's story. Um, for Jacob, what troubles him most is that he will soon be called upon to stand in front of the litigation while the rest of the world stares at him. To say it is unnerving is insufficient. He's been trying to quiet the part of his brain that is telling him he could be made pretty famous by all of this because he is not that kind of person. He's not someone who has aspired ever to stand in front of a crowd. 
He's a creative guy, writes poetry and reads a lot and likes to play Irish music. He doesn't consider himself an activist, didn't grow up in the movement. The facts just happened as they did. He started protesting the pipeline. It's a natural gas pipeline that's proposed to cross near his property and that is already pretty uh, potentially combustible. Uh, then spent five days fasting in front of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in Washington, D.C. to underscore his point. He joined the lawsuit, went to Standing Rock, attended a World Peace and Prayer Day ceremony, not necessarily in that order. And meanwhile, the lawsuit grew legs. In time, court after court decided in the plaintiff's favor, and the lawyers from our Children's Trust proved themselves capable of leading a case of national, international import. Now here he is, center stage imminently facing the curtain call. And while Jacob has thought deeply about the issues he chose to litigate and believes with every bit of himself that this case is important, those things matter little to the question of whether he sees himself as a leader in the vein. He does not, and it doesn't matter. It's not really that I wanna give an example, it's more, how do I live up to that responsibility to set an example? Because I'm here, people are looking at us, he says. So in the summer of 2018, he had been spending a lot of his days thinking about how to live up to being a person that a lot of other people were about to be looking at. And the best way he could imagine standing in the spotlight was to simply do the right thing. He was studious, so he studied, studied on what that meant. And in observing how others had done it, he had adopted an approach that was two parts Martin Luther King Jr. and one part Samuel Beckett. This happened because he was watching the Parkland youth closely. And in an interview on The Daily Show, some of the youth who had taken on the gun lobby after 17 people were killed by an active shooter at their high school talked about the teachings of MLK. Jacob realized he could use these teachings too, particularly the fourth, the notion that when you act on behalf of the cause, it is not about you. Whether someone throws a bucket over your head or whether you're jeered at in the back of a bus, when you are speaking for a cause, to do so with grace and nonviolence is an art. That when the world is watching, to stand strong and peacefully is to speak a language that people can hear across the political spectrum. To be gentle is to be understood rather than to create opportunities for hate or division or for anger. The anger, it is out there. I try not to think too much about things I can't control. I'm not going to leave this lawsuit and I'm not going to tone down my public persona or tone down interviews or retreat. So then the question becomes, what's the best way to present the message? I believe if we can do it in the right way, it almost undercuts the backlash. He is preparing for it anyway, thinking about cybersecurity, thinking about his personal security. He wants to unite people, reach past the hostile divide that political and environmental discourse has become. And to judge how well he is doing, he needs only to walk to his nearest neighbor's house, Douglas County is awash in conservatism, and try on the things he might say, try to listen, try to see if he can meet people around the values they all share, like keeping the pipeline off their farms, protecting their trees and their animals. But this is dicey terrain. Before his family purchased the land, there were stashes of guns in the hills and they knew the area was a stronghold for white supremacists and other people disinclined to share his views about most things. Yet here he is, long hair and flannel, as much a part of this place as anyone else. His tolerant Quaker disposition and his farm experiment and zero impact living are not typical, but solar, they can all agree on that. He's trying to find the lines, reading a lot about how to talk to people through common values, set aside judgment and know that people can be reached, that if you find them where they live and let them really know you, they will listen. Man, I don't know. I feel so humbled by so many of those voices that you render in the book. I just, and I feel when you're writing about them, you know, I do feel your admiration and um, respect for them very much in the ways that you describe them. Um, your desire to call attention to the work they're doing and invite more of us to, to join them in doing that work. And I, I mean, I really do, well, you live also in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. I mean, you know, the, the Bundy, the standoff at Malara National Wildlife Refuge in 26. I mean, there is, there are examples there as here, you're right, of this kind of, um, the, the, the real and present danger that, you know, just some 
people with enough firepower will just say no. Say no to the federal government, say no to the state government. I don't know, take the governor, kidnap the governor. <laughs> you know, this is this week in Michigan. I mean, I, I, these, it, it, it almost boggles my mind that young people are willing to stand up in that kind of climate of fear in this way. Um, and it, yeah, I just wonder if you have any, any words about that, about, you know, sort of what, what, what courage looks like right now as these questions of um, non-negligible threats of real harm in, it appear to be increasing around us. What do you see as um, the ways in which those of us um, who feel relatively insulated from that edge, right, can be supportive, can lend support to those who are standing right there on the edge, taking a stand of this kind. I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Well, sure. Um, I mean, maybe a few. I, I think um, when, I, when I've talked to the plaintiffs, you know, people always ask me, you know, what they're like, like a group. Um, and, and they're very, very different. But one thing that they do consistently say is that they get a lot of people saying, oh, thank God, you know, <laughs> you, you filed this litigation. You're our last hope as if uh, everyone else can just abdicate their responsibility to, to do things. Like they, they've taken that, many of them, very personally. Um, and, and so I think showing up any way you can show up, right? Whether it's just, whether it's voting, whether it's giving to a cause, whether it's supporting a young person in your life or is, is a way to be present and to just be aware, you know, that, that we're living um, at, at the, the <laughs> edge of history here, you know, uh, we are experiencing climate breakdown and it's not a maybe, it's now. And, um, you know, we all have to participate in how that problem is going to get solved. Um, I mean, I really enjoy working with these folks because they're so positive and there's so much optimism and there's a lot of talk about solutions and they are out there. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, that maybe that's my takeaway, but, you know, props to, to Jacob and people like him, who, him in particular, have done such an incredible job working so patiently in communities where um, he, he's very likely to experience a lot of backlash, and he just shows up again and again and again and, and stands by what he has to say and does it in such a non-confrontational manner. Um, I think it's exemplary. And I, I mean, I'd love to have that kind of um, patience and tolerance. It is, yeah, it's, ab it's absolutely humbling and inspiring. And yeah, and I, and I do think that um, not all of us can, can write a book about it, but, but yours is incredibly useful. And I, as I say this as a parent to a, to a teenager who's very active in, in these circles, and in part because as she puts it, like, when you are that frightened of the future bearing down on you, there is no solace but to act. I mean, it's the only thing that makes her feel better is to do something and connect with others who are similarly inclined in order to, to do that. And so actually wanted to be with us tonight, but is running a call <laughs> with Sunrise colleagues and coalition colleagues as happens most nights. I mean, it puts our academic Zoom schedules to shame because a lot of these folks, um, they aren't just meeting up on the playground and holding hands and skipping into court. Like they are actively working to build coalitions in spite of COVID, in spite of the differences between a drought stricken Navajo reservation. And that Navajo territory, just to loop back to that for a moment, um, has been so unbelievably unfairly burdened by the COVID pandemic, the suffering, the human suffering in the Navajo Nation, the Native peoples have died in numbers far greater than should have happened. And so, you know, the kinds of obstacles that, that the pandemic presents to the young people doing this work are not just obstacles of, you know, format and gosh, it's hard to run a march when there's a pandemic on, but also of actual human reserves of energies available, right, in your own family, in your own setting, to to do this work. I really wonder if you um, ha have any, any thoughts about the ways in which um, each of these different plaintiffs is grappling with very different constraints 
um, and limitations and somehow transcending them to come together and, and move this forward. It, it, the case did move further forward than most of its kind have done, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And I think there are still some decisions pending. Do you want to let us know what's, what's the latest before we move into Q&A? Because it is 7.50. Yeah, sure. Um, the case, it, it was dismissed by the Ninth Circuit from the trial court, and um, it, is, it is a sign uh, that the um, Trump administration's increasing interest in controlling lower courts by um, applying downward pressure through uh, court stacking is uh, working. So uh, that is unfortunate, but the plaintiffs have asked for a full panel here, full hearing of the Ninth Circuit, which is, as opposed to being here, heard by three judges, they're potentially going to be heard by the whole circuit. Um, no ruling on that yet, although it could come at any time. And then the path is they either go back to, to trial court and have a trial, uh, which is the normal course of process, or, or it's a question um, for the Supreme Court. But I think, um, you know, there's a sense from many of the plaintiffs, right, that they win on a lot of fronts. So where they find the time and energy and how they direct it, I think really varies from plaintiff to plaintiff, but there is an abiding sense of like, there are a lot of ways to show up to this work. And I would say, um, you know, they're, they're winning the culture war. So, you know, mm -hmm. whether this case makes it all the way through the court or not, um, I think that the message uh, has resonated. Amen to that. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I do hope that, that you're right about that. I, I do believe that you're right about that. I want to just um, make sure that, thank John for, for inviting folks to, to submit questions. He writes in the chat, hey, y'all can submit questions to me here anytime and I'll read a selection of them towards the conclusion of the conversation. So John, um, would you like to chime in at this point with any of them? We do not have any questions yet, so people can still, if they're mulling on them, can compose them and send them to me. Um, but I'll go off video and, and hand it back over to you, Rebecca, if there's any last questions you wanted to yeah, ask no me or, or another um, passage, and I'll come back on video if I do um, see another question come through. Great. Well, I'll keep an eye out for you. Just don't let me roll over you because, you know, I do have... I. <laughs> so much to ask <laughs> Lee about and so much that I think actually uh, this audience could really benefit from hearing from the book itself since uh, it is, you know, one that's been out just long enough to be, you know, circulating and tantalizing, but maybe not long enough for all of us to have read it. So I think it's nice to get the, the previews and the glimpses in, into the book. Um, and I, and I do, I do appreciate the portrait in the book of this sort of, uh, yeah, the, the brave folks within the judicial and court system who've you know been a part of keeping the case alive in various ways, and I think that's a really nice aspect as well of you know the ways that this this history of this particular case will end up being written not only by you but by by others too. Um, I have colleagues in law schools and programs around the country who are really interested in this in this case as um, you know what it's becoming, which is a bit of a landmark um, event for setting precedents for people to come together and, um, and train attention on these issues. I don't know if you have um, thoughts about, you know, the ways that we can do our best job of teaching, you know, for those of us on the phone who are in education, who are educators, either at the university or the secondary and other levels, um, do you have any words of wisdom as a storyteller who's so good at your craft for the ways that we can bring this to life for young people? Um, even if we can't ask all of them to read the book itself, any thoughts about that? Well, my my personal education came from from these plaintiffs who I think are really passionate speakers. And like you mentioned, there are so many uh, great young activists like your daughter Nana who are out there just killing it. Um, peer uh, peer to peer education, I think, is a great thing. Um, I I mean, being exposed to plaintiffs or young people who are having, um, you know, very personal impacts of climate breakdown. Uh, it was a really powerful experience for me and I think it would be for anybody. Yeah, no, that's for sure. I mean, maybe it's partly just about holding open the space um, in our teaching and our practice, whether we're leaders in community organizations or faith organization, faith-based organizations, or, um, you know, 
educational settings, but holding open the space for that peer-to-peer -peer, um, sharing of experience to happen um, and not trying to teach over it or talk over it so much. And I think that's hard for us to learn to do, but as an academic, as an educator, I am trying, Lee, to learn to step back and, and listen and let those stories rush in and teach me. Um, so I really do want to thank you for sharing the ones you have. There is one more passage if we have time I'd love for you to read before we close out, which is one um, that, that comes uh, sort of towards the middle, beginning middle of the book. It's a, um, it's a passage about um, on the ride back, kind of about landscape and politics on page six of, I think, the print version of the book. Um, and I think it might be a beautiful passage for us to read, um, just, just to reflect a little bit on the mix of natural and political forces at play for people here and how it all washes over us as we move through our lives, you know? Yeah, I think of, I think of this passage that way as well. Um, so Jaden and her family were kind enough to take me to the, uh, out on the swamp to see the Bayou Bridge pipeline construction, and, which is the other end of the Dakota Access Pipeline, so the other end of Standing Rock. And it's being built in a very uh, sensitive um, swampland. And uh, it was it's a really great day. Um, so this begins there. Uh, on the ride back from the swamp, Jaden sacks out. She puts her headphones on and stares out the window until she's lying down and if not sleeping, close. It was an early morning and owing to the day's jelly beans, the sugar crash is probably imminent. Jaden strikes me as this way, two speeds. When she's into a thing, she's animated and talks fast, but when she's not, she's quiet, watching and thoughtful. She listens to music, probably K-pop, and watches the live oaks and the dry lawns go by maybe one ear open while Cherie and I talk up front. This is Jane's mom. Two days earlier, I'd driven these roads outside rain in search of where the land meets the sea, south of Jane's hometown and into the White Lake wetlands, trying to understand the rising waters by finding an edge of the land. That's what I'm used to after all, an edge of the land, a place that ends in beach or rock or sometimes both, a habitat between civilization and water, a boardwalk, a cityscape, but that doesn't exist here. Instead, I drove through land so flat it seemed to bend the curve of the horizon upward, past the signs for po'boys and Zydeco dance and the tractors for sale in the sugarcane fields, past the billboard with the towering cutout of a lawyer in a suit promising payouts for oil rig accidents. I drove until the dragonflies got so big I flinched when they neared the windshield. Along the way, I learned things. Like how the storm clouds gather at noon, sometimes issue only hollow threats, but other times break open so a massive amount of water falls out. And how afterward there are a few minutes of reprieve, but otherwise the air is unceasingly sticky hot. And how people jaywalk as if there's no time to spare before melting, and drivers speed madly down seven lanes, sequestered in their air conditioning until they can park and dash to the other air conditioning, grocery store, pharmacies, Many of these places smell submerged as if they've been dredged out of a fish tank. I drove until the horizon further inverted itself and fuzzy little trees dotted the line between the land and sky. I drove until the sultans play Creole and the buildings starting to rise up on stilts to where irrigation ditches were full and there was moss growing inside and dikes were required and cattle were nosing around in between. Past the cemetery where people get buried above the ground and flagpoles too along the way but I never reached the end. Never a rocky outcrop or that patch of sand, just a steady negotiation between land and water until the water started to lap at the sides of the road. East of the wetlands, there were turnouts now and then, short ditch, short dirt roads on levees between water and farms, the occasional boat launch into a canal. One after another, these roads were full of garbage, Gatorade bottles and plastic bags, Glass and cans rolling on the ground, no one to come and clean them, it seemed, which speaks to how these wilds are held. Farm gate, cow, trash pile, crop, utility poles riding off into the distance. All the while, the radio told the story about a haggard man coming to church, the devil inside him until Jesus commanded, and the demon threw the man away. 
It all went on long enough that the landscape started to blur into American flags, mythic evil, and garbage. Soon the birds and the bugs came to take it all. Ibis and cormorants, vireos and wrens, the ever larger dragonflies riding on the wind. Eventually I reached a place called Pecan Island, found a trailer on pilings, then a house on 10 feet of stilt. There was a gas facility near where it all just sank into the sea, Connecticut's barge terminal for liquefied natural gas, a few miles west, a preserve named for the Rockefellers. Cherie asks me about the case. If I know it will change now that Kavanaugh is about to be appointed to the Supreme Court, if I think a conservative court will affect Juliana and its trial date in three weeks, this is a question a lot of people are asking lately, but I don't know the answer to it. No one really does. Kavanaugh has just undergone the first days of his confirmation hearings, and Cherie says the politics of his confirmation make her mad, that it is especially intolerable to watch mothers of daughters reflexively defend him just because he was picked by a red president. Now another thing to protect with all the rest, her daughter's sense of being girls. We cast, pass a campaign sign for Brian Douglas Theriot, who is running for sheriff. Cherie says, there are only two things you need three names for, being a serial killer and running for office in South Louisiana. Good joke from Cherie. <laughs> I have to say the reason I flashed on that paragraph on that passage was partly because of my time walking the coastline of West Africa and the estuaries there are full of plastic water bottles and even still some manatees and other wildlife hippos even. But this idea of my years as someone who studies environmental politics in Africa, seeing how much the fear of environmental volatility and other forms of volatility can actually enhance people's willingness to tolerate authoritarianism because they fear change and they fear a lack of strength. But in fact, right, it's not the kind of strength we need. It's this resilient, collaborative kind of strength that you have described in this book, which stands as a beacon. We do have a couple of questions in the queue. So I want to flip it back to John for a minute to read them out loud before we close out tonight. Yeah, there's just a couple uh, quick questions here. Um, the first one um, asks, what remedy are they, the 21 plaintiffs, seeking through the court system? Obviously, the, the contention is that um, the actions of the U.S. government to promote fossil fuel economy violate um, First Amendment rights. But I, I may be lost on, on, on the beyond the contention is, is sort of what would be a, seen as a um, positive outcome. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the case does charge that support for a fossil fuel energy system violates the constitutional rights of youth by permitting, authorizing, and subsidizing a fossil fuel energy system that promotes climate change. What the plaintiffs are seeking in terms of remedy is they want a climate remediation plan. They want the government to have to take a full accounting of its own carbon footprint, basically, the emissions it's responsible for both through its own actions and through permitting, and they want to plan for how to draw that carbon down to safe levels. Thank you. And then the second question is, um, do you see any chance for similar legal actions in the future, either in the United States or internationally? Yes, absolutely. In fact, there are numerous um, international cases pending and resolved. Uh, there's a case called, uh, uh, it's Urgenda. Uh, my, my Dutch in-laws are gonna gasp at my pronunciation of uh, as versus the Netherlands. And um, it has been actually decided in favor of the plaintiffs. It's very similar grounds and the Netherlands is now at work on a responsive climate remediation plan. Um, similar cases have been filed lots of other places in the world, most recently Canada and Mexico and Portugal. Um, other nations other than the United States have human rights law baked into their constitution or their court systems that make it easier for this kind of litigation to advance. I think the United States is the hardest place or one of the hardest places to try a case like this because our constitutional protections don't really extend um, to having basically a livable, a, a livable planet or safe, uh, safe living conditions, whereas in many other cultures, um, 
those rights are, are guaranteed, more guaranteed. So uh, maybe we'll see this litigation be more successful elsewhere, but still fingers crossed for it in the US. Thank you. And so we've reached the top of the hour. So I want to once again, thank Rebecca D. Harden and Lee Vandervu for joining us this evening at Home with Literati and for sharing um, this book and for the really wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your questions as well. And um, we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And we hope to see you at the next event as well. So take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for being such a great host, Literati. Well.